Well, hello, it's wonderful to be here. And uh, thank you for inviting me, Eric. I'd like to tell a story that I've heard from many sources. It's hard to identify one place where I got the story from. And it's part of mythology, part folk tale. It's the story of Queen Anait from Armenia. Well, there was a prince, Prince Vachigan. And Prince Vachigan was hunting along with his trusted servant, Nazar. All day long in the hot weather he had been hunting on horseback, but they had caught nothing. There was no game to be had. And towards the end of the afternoon, the sun still hot in the sky, thirsty, dried out. They came to a small community and there were young women who were gathering water from the well in jugs. And Vachigan and Naza pulled up their horses. Vachigan jumped down and reached for a jug of water from one of those young women. And she took it from him. Or rather, he took it from her. But before he could drink it, another one of those young women took the jug from that first young woman and looked Prince Vachigan in the eye. She slowly emptied the water onto the ground. He was perplexed. She took another jug full of that clear, fresh water from the well, looked at Vachigan and emptied the jug of water onto the ground. A third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, Vachigan was becoming incensed. Why would she refuse to give him any water? But only when she refilled the jug the seventh time, she passed it to him. And thirstily, he drank down that fresh, cold water and then passed the jug to his friend, the servant Nazar, who finished. Why would you refuse to give me water when I have been riding all day? And this young woman did not flinch, did not look away. She looked Prince Vachigan in the eye and she said, I saw that you were hot and thirsty. If you had drunk this cold water straight off after riding, it would have done you harm. Now that you have time to rest, it does you good. And immediately Vachigan saw the wisdom in these young woman's words and asked who she was. I am Anait, daughter of Aaron the shepherd. And she turned and walked away. She did not ask who he was. He climbed onto his horse and rode home across the land with his friend and servant Nazar. But he could not get from his mind this young woman. He told his father, the king, his mother, the queen, I have met the young woman that I will marry. And he told them the story. But who is she? She is Anait, daughter of Aaron the shepherd. Daughter of a shepherd, said the king. <laughs> well, you cannot marry her. She is below you. But he could not get her from his head. He sent his servant Nazar to seek her out, to ask her to come to the capital to be his bride. And Nazar rode away. When he came to that community, he asked for the house of Aaron the shepherd. And when he entered, he saw it was the most humble abode. He asked Aaron the shepherd if his daughter would marry Prince Vachigan, who will be king. I cannot make the decision, said Aaron. My daughter decides her future for herself. So Nazar went seeking for Anait. As he went across that land, he saw many trees and words were etched into the bark of every tree. He walked past stones and words in different languages were carved into every rock and stone. He finally found Anait. She was sitting with young people around her. And she was teaching them, teaching them how to read and how to write. When she had finished her lessons, Naza asked her, Will you be the bride to my master, Prince Vachigan? So that is who your master is, said Anaid. I cannot marry him. Why would you refuse to marry the prince? 
If he is a prince, perhaps he has no trade. I have sworn that I will only marry a man who knows a trade. And she turned back to her teaching. Nazar couldn't understand. He climbed on his horse and rode swiftly across the land. When he told the news to his master, Vachagan, Vachagan was amazed. Again he told the news to his father and mother. Then she is not for you. She is too proud. But he could not get her from his thoughts. Vachagan, discussed with Nather, discussed with all around him, all of the wise people of that land, who and what he should learn as a trade. It was decided that no finer trade could be had than that of a weaver. He would weave the finest woolen cloth from golden wool. Well, the wool was provided and he began to learn to weave. It took him many months of practice. Finally, he began to weave the finest golden cloth. When it was complete, he was satisfied. He gave that cloth to Nazar, who rode back to Anait, and when he found her and showed her the cloth, she admired him. Is this the cloth made by Prince Vachigan? Then I will come gladly. And she left her good people, who cried and wept to see her go, and she rode across the land to the capital. And then the wedding was arranged. The people were amazed. Anait seemed so humble and yet so wise. They admired her beauty, and soon they loved her, as did her father-in-law, the king, and her mother-in-law, the queen. It wasn't long after that the old king and queen left this world, and Vachigan and Ainait became king and queen. The people admired her intelligence, and she taught the people of the city as well how to read and how to write. Soon they had learned many things from her in many languages, and no finer student was there than her husband, King Vachigan, who soon learned many symbols, characters, writings. After some months had passed, they missed Nazar the servant. I have not seen him for many weeks. Where can he be? Husband, said Anait. He is your friend. You must find him. Ride on a horse across the land. Disguise yourself as an ordinary person of the land. I will remain here and look after the affairs of state. Well, Vachigan trusted his good wife, the Queen Anait. Everyone loved and admired and respected her. So he took her advice and left the city. He rode for many days. He came into the mountains and there, in a barren place surrounded by rocky mountains, he came to a crescent-shaped lake. He rested and drank from the water. But from that nearby mountain, that rocky mountain, there appeared a band of robbers. They seized Vachigan, not knowing who he was, and took him deep into that cave. They closed a door of iron. In the darkness, Vachigan was lost. He was brought to the leader of that band of robbers, who asked, What is your trade? If you have no trade, you will be put to death. There are many men in here, many who have been arrested, but only those who can make money for me remain here. Well, Vachigan, he saw that he had no option. I do have a trade, he said. I am a weaver of cloth. Bring me the finest golden cloth, and I will make you a cloth that it will be invaluable. Well, it was agreed. The cloth, fabric, the wool was brought, and Vachigan had a loom made, a wooden loom. He designed it with his own hands, 
And there in that deep, dark cave, he met many other men with long beards who had been there many years, some of them months. And among the most recent arrivals was his friend, Nazar. Nazar warned him, Oh, my master, take great care. These are murderous men. Vatjagan began to work on that loom. He wove golden cloth. It took him many months to complete the task, and when the cloth was made, he showed it to that leader of the robbers. This is a fine cloth indeed. Do you know where you will get the best price? said Vatjagan. Tell me. I have heard that there is a queen in the great city. Her name is Queen Anaid. I have heard of her, of course. Go to her. Surely you will get what you deserve. Well, the robber took that golden cloth and left the cave. And you can imagine, it wasn't long before he had found the capital and stood before Anait, and she sat on the throne, so wise. Who are you, she said. I am a man, a traveller, a tradesman. And what have you brought for me? And he brought out the golden cloth, but she barely looked at it. Who made this cloth? A, a, a man of great skill. Where? I have travelled far and wide, in, in India. In India, she said. Let me look at the cloth. And she examined it. She turned to her guards. Put this man in a dungeon, she said. Tonight we will prepare. Tomorrow morning at sunrise we will depart. All of the citizens will come with me, all those who are faithful to their king, Vatjagan. Tell everyone to bring their tools and their weapons. At sunrise, Anaid was already dressed in shining armour. She sat on a fine horse and rode forward, and everyone followed, carrying weapons and all of their tools. Every tradesperson had their own tools. They crossed the land. She carried with her the golden cloth, and as she rode she examined it. She found in that golden cloth secret symbols, written in a language that very few would understand, a language that she had taught to her husband, Vatjagan. And the symbols told that high in the mountains, in a rocky place, there was a crescent-shaped lake, and nearby was a rock. And in that rock was an iron door, impenetrable, and behind the door a cave. So when she found that crescent lake, they searched around, moved bushes aside, and there was a heavy iron door, a mighty door that could not be penetrated. She asked the people to bring out their mallets and their chisels, and they worked at the rock round the outside of the iron door. For many hours they worked, they toiled until every rock was broken and removed, and the iron door entire could be removed from the entrance to the cave. And as they stood there, slowly from the cave, there came men, some old, all pale-faced, with long beards. They covered their eyes in the face of the sunlight. They emerged into that free, open space, and among them was Naza and his master, King Vatjagan. The people were amazed. Our king, our king is freed. But Vatjagan stood before his wife, Anaid. Now, of course, the robbers who had hidden deep in that cave were found by Anaid and Vatjagan's people and brought out and imprisoned. Naza looked at Anait. Master, it is because of Anait's intelligence, because she taught languages, that now 
you and I are freed. And King Vatican laughed. <laughs> My friend, it started long before that. The day when she poured six jugfuls of water onto the ground and then gave the seventh to me. That was the day when we were saved. Okay, fantastic. Okay, everybody, the four questions. Yes. Uh, one thing that you especially enjoyed about the story or the telling? Any suggestions for improvement or addition? Does it remind you of any other experience or story? And um, what do you what do you get out of this? Anybody? It was like a fairy story, but with a moral tag the back that everyone needs to know a trade, be he king or otherwise. So uh, David, she, uh, I was a little surprised that the, the queen did not ask the, um, the robber who brought the cloth. She could have asked him where the creator of the cloth was, but she didn't uh, bother. <laughs> Well, she did ask, but he wasn't very forthcoming with a, an honest answer. Ah, okay. Uh, this is Dr. Ya. It was riveting. I was all in it and all encompassing with the, uh, the lesson about life and the lesson about love and the lesson about uh, 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 the empowerment uh, through education and, and uh, what is it? And, her being very humble uh, and, and, I, and to rise to become uh, uh, the queen is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ya. I feel the same way about that story. It's a story that I told with two dear friends got married last year. It was a, for me, it's a story, a very positive story about marriage, about mutual respect. It's also a story about leadership, I think. Um, I've been telling quite a few stories. I'm preparing to tell quite a few stories this week in preparation for next Saturday's big event that some of you may have heard about when Charles actually gets a crown on his head. So I'm calling these tales, tales uh, warnings for kings and queens. Because I think being a British citizen, we often look unto ourselves Maybe sometimes we look across the pond to the States as well, but we very rarely look at other parts of the world and other languages and learning from diverse cultures. And this is one of the lessons I think that, uh, <laughs> that we need to learn because we're, we're tending to be a bit too narrow minded here in the UK these days, what well, after Brexit and everything. But I would also tell you, Dr. Yar, story, Anait, some of you may know this, but in Armenian mythology, Anait is also an important figure. She is the goddess of fertility and knowledge. Ah, yes. So she's, she's more than a queen in a fairy tale. She is actually a, a, a deity. Ah, excellent. The other thing I want to say, is your story have inspired me. And I was saying, God, I need to get in touch with you to write a story about the uh, the first empress in the Americas. Nice. No? Sounds fascinating. <laughs> yes, I, from you, you inspired me. I just want you to know that. Thank you. I love textiles very much. And you reminded me of the stories I've heard about um, <laughs> people, about um, somebody's lost and they weave the directions in the in the in the in the rug, and I actually brought that awareness and think about on the um, in in America when the when the slaves were escaping, people would hang up quilts, and the quilts had symbols and signs in them to tell them what they, how to get on the railroad, and how to get out of slavery. 
I'd love it if you shared that a link to that story with me, Diana. That would that would be fun. I don't have a link to that story because I just I kind of associated the fact that or I heard it as just a little piece on right. the Underground Railroad that there were signs in the quilts. Yeah. I love this idea. It happens a lot, I think, in stories in in the Middle East, in Asia generally maybe, where there's uh a communication between two characters and there's a messenger but the messenger is 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 often a person of power but they're ignorant of the of the deeper meaning of the message so mm -hmm. the, the the robber the leader robber was unaware of what he was passing on to the the, the, the communication that was being sent between those two individuals who are operating at a let's say a higher level of consciousness I have vague uh, memories of uh, stories about in World War I or World War II that there were um, singers uh, or other performers who would perform in public, uh, but really they were spies and they were giving secret messages uh, while they were also uh, performing for the public. Is, is anyone familiar with that? those kind of um, stories? Have you heard of that, David? I hadn't, but it's fascinating. Yeah. The code in the song. Yes. Oh, I, I wanted to add, David. Uh, I'll just, oh, go ahead, carry Anaga. On, no, carry on, carry on. Uh, I, I just want to say, David, I, I, I love your cadences. Um, I think, you know, just the, the time you take with the story, I think it's a wonderful example of what Eric uh, one of Eric's points in what he sent to us all about taking time and allowing pauses. I would say that you follow Eric's suggestions well, but I'm sure that you've been doing it for quite a long time on your own. Um, and uh, it's just it's just a great example to all of us to remember to take our time with it that the that often our listeners need uh, more time to let the images and to let the sequence of the story and the plots and the character characteristics of the characters set in. And we who know our stories well can often move through them very quickly, but it's very good for us to um, take our time with it. Uh, it's interesting you say that, Barry, about knowing the story well, because it is a story I know very well, but it's also a story I realize I haven't told for a while. And maybe that was also part of the reason for some of the pauses. And also, you probably noticed that there are a couple of places where I was, oh, I was searching. But sometimes, sometimes I like that in story. When I'm, when I'm the storyteller, or I'm listening to a story, I know that the storyteller is also searching because it, it can make it very fresh. But it felt like I was flying by the seat of my pants at times. I just wanted to add that the story uh, reminded me of a, a folk tale from India, which talks about, um, again, the fabric, the Banarasi um, uh, brocade fabric and the weavers of the fabric and how the weaver, one weaver spoke to uh, um, an envoy of uh, Mongols who had come to the king and um, they spoke again in code words and how he kind of uh, had a conversation completely in code words and it was all Greek and Latin to the whole uh, court and it just reminded me of that story a very beautiful story whatever you said and I think what Barry said I totally understand I mean I totally agree with him and that's something that I have been wanting to incorporate in myself of bringing that a pause or stillness but I just get so carried off when I start narrating so I, I'll take that I think I'll, I'll start listening to David to get pauses in my storytelling thank oh, you thank, for that. thank you Anika but like, I, I go back to what I said earlier that for me this is a, for me a very affirming story about marriage because the marriage happens fairly early in the story but it's not the it's not the end so many stories you know, happy story, fairy tales, let's say, finish with a marriage. But it's just the beginning, really, for them, where that and, and particularly for Vatchigan, who has so much to learn. Your story reminded me of um, my marriage. <laughs> As, um, I, put a, I put an ad in the paper here in Chennai uh, 18 years ago saying a uh, USA man seeks Tamil woman for marriage. The, uh, the, main, con the main condition was that um, she should have an interesting career. 
and I got very lucky. I married a, an Indian woman who is a psychological counselor and actually a specialist in um, expressive arts therapy, was using the different arts therapeutically, especially psychodrama. So um, I'm I'm wondering if we're following the pattern of your story where either she's giving me secret messages or I'm giving her secret messages through the uh, through through that uh, through that activity. But it's it, think, it sounds good. I think the secret is both ways, learning from each other, isn't it? Being open to yeah, including, continue that journey. Including symbolic languages. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again, Eric, for 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 having me along because I, I couldn't thank make you. it to the earlier arrangement, but I, I've made it finally yes. today. And, and uh, happy happy May Day, everybody, and to, and, to workers and, around and the world. Everybody should know uh, David uh, t teaches all over the world and has uh, collaborations with people all over the world. And um, uh, on, the, on that note, Eric, can I make a very tiny plug? Of course. Well. First of all, um, this this Friday evening UK, so afternoon US, uh, USA and late evening India, I'm doing Warnings for Kings and Queens. It's a free event on the world at the World Storytelling Cafe. It's going to be stories for children of all ages, but it's going to be very interactive. And and like Eric was just saying, I run a lot of courses. So if you're interested, um, I've got a course coming up in in June. So just look me up. Now, the warnings for kings and queens, is that part of the uh, coronation celebration? That's my that's my contribution. Uh -huh. And the question will be, just like today, what do you get from the stories that I'm telling? What 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 lessons do we have? But do we get? But it's all you know, it's all about leadership, essentially. Uh huh. And well, I hope many parts of the world. I hope the leaders of your country uh, get the message. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Dream on. How do you celebrate May Day? Happy May Day, and how do you celebrate it? Oh, thank you, Nyana. Well, here here in the UK, there's traditions, um, very old traditions, dancing around the May Pole and and welcoming the May Queen. So uh, it's, it's not happening today. It may be in some parts of the UK. It will be happening today, but there's a lovely village where Tammy, my wife and I go, where it's, there's, there's dancing around the Maypole and there's kids dressed all in white who dance. And then they, there's, a, there's a rock and they sit on the, a throne on top of the rock. And one of the younger girls is, is, is crowned May Queen. Mm. So that's one tradition. Um, but of course, yeah, it's Workers' Day. So it's a day of, of unity and, and the struggle for workers' rights. And that's more important now than ever. So yeah. there's lots of big things about uh, the beginning of May. It's also the beginning of spring, of course. And I'm looking yeah. out at, my, at, at our garden full of wild flowers and unmown lawn. Uh, yeah, we I, have I think... No mo we have mm. something here in Massachusetts right now called No Mo May. We have the same. Right no Mo yes. May. What May. is No Mo May? <laughs> Niana, you can explain. Well, there's a big, because we want people to have more wildflowers and native growth mm. in our in our property instead of grass, which doesn't help the soil. Mm. They decided that on May, people won't mow. And so oh, where I- Oh, M-O-W. Yes, so where wow. I live, there's lots of edges. It's lots. It's still a house in a semi-city, but there's lots of edges and um, parking lots and things, and they just let it grow and see what flowers are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I'm looking out at a, at a lawn full of daisies and dandelions. Some of us would like that to be every every month, but it's a good way to get people started. So thank you. So it, it seems May Day, it, it really, the roots of it is a fertility celebration, um, but then it has also been uh, appropriated by the uh, international workers movement. So we can... <laughs> We can enjoy it on both levels. Uh, we being story workers, uh, we uh, we can also enjoy the that aspect of it. Okay, uh, uh, can I stop recording this this segment? Yes.